can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Kevin Delano and uh, with KarmaCasting.com. And Kevin, before I formally introduce you, I like to point out some other episodes people should check out of the podcast. This is going to be an amazing episode because because Kevin has started and sold multiple companies. Um, and it's it's really a rarity to see someone who started and sold so many companies. There's an interview I did, Kevin, with Cameron Healy, who started uh, Kettle Chips, um, mm. which he grew. And, you know, speaking of serial entrepreneurs, you know, he couldn't help himself. And, you know, he, he started um, Kona Brewing Company and started restaurants around Kona Brewing Company. And it, it always looks sometimes amazing from the outside. But like when we dug into the story, there were some hard times and there were some challenges along the way, especially with growth. And he he, he was totally open and shared a lot of these. Um, and that's what I love about these interviews. People just, it looks great from the outside, but there's a lot of, it's, it's hard work, you know, is the bottom line. Um, so that was a great one. Um, I also did one with uh, Kevin Hurrigan, who started an agency back in 1995. Um, you remember those times, Kevin. And uh, he... <laughs> You know, his agency and his business had to evolve. Um, he still has an agency, Spinatech, now um, all these years. And so it's just amazing to hear his journey and so many more. So you can check out on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. And we do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. You know, Kevin, we call ourselves the magic elves that are running around, making it look easy for the host and the company, kind of like what you do with Karma Casting. Uh, essentially, your team is running around helping people with events and promotional products and everything else. Um, well, that's what we do for podcasting. So, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire on this planet and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com and email support at rise25.com. Um, and let me formally choose Kevin Delano has founded and co-founded. This is at least six businesses I can count. There's probably more that I could not find over the past 30 years. Yeah. And he started and led companies across a variety of industries. Revenues range from 2 million all the way above 90 million with employees up to 400. Um, Karma Casting is one of the fastest growing and largest talent marketplaces in North America. Uh, we have Suit Soap, which is an all natural line of personal soap products designed and tested by firefighters to detoxify. So it's not just to clean, to detoxify skin, hair, and combat odors. Air Intel Aerospace, drone surveillance, search and rescue. You know, Kevin just, he can't get enough. Like, I don't know how he finds the time. We have IMD Health Global Corp, um, which was, they took an old paper-based and verbal-based education process and digitized it for healthcare professionals. They sold that to a publicly traded company, actually, um, and consumer impact marketing, uh, CIM, which was you know Canada's largest third-party sales and marketing agency, over 300 full-time staff, 7,000 field staff, achieved over $90 million in revenue and sold to Mosaic. And then Launch, which was a marketing agency for brand creative and grew from one to 25 staff, over 10 million and sold that. So Kevin, thanks for joining me. That's quite an intro. Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, I think you earned it. Yeah. So <laughs> um, take me back to your early 20s. What, did, what was the original idea for a business? Yeah, you know, it was interesting. Um, I was in college uh, in the east coast of uh, Canada, uh, Dalhousie, and I was um, working at a restaurant. And I loved working at the restaurant. Honestly, to this day, I would tell you it's one of my best jobs being a waiter and a bartender. I just loved it. Had more disposable income then probably than I do now. Um, <laughs> but uh, but life was pretty free and fancy. And I got a summer job being a Gatorade sales rep. And this was back when Gatorade was launching in Canada. 
we had one product to sell, orange. And if we could take it around to convenience stores um, and try to convince a convenience store manager who's sitting in the back shop, you know, often very dirty, cutting off the fish of a head because it was just like it's the types of stores we had in the East Coast of Canada, very fishing orientated. Um, and it was downright dirty. Um, I said, you know what, I'm going to try this thing called sales. And I got and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And um, that spawned a whole career change for me. When I started college, I was going to be a doctor uh, until I went to my first lab. And I said, I don't have the patience for this nor the aptitude to do that. And so I was a bit lost, um, took this opportunity and turned it into a great career. Um, and my think, you know, my early 20s, I graduated when I was 21 and I had to make a very quick decision when I graduated to either go work for a big conglomerate at the time it was Quaker Oats, uh, which owned Gatorade at the time. Um, comfy job, company car, good benefits, some perks, all those great things. Maybe I get to go to head office in Chicago, um, or I could go work for this tiny little marketing agency in Toronto. Um, you know, and if you're in Canada, going to Toronto is like going to the Mecca. It's like going to New York City or Los Angeles. And so I never wanted to go to a big city. Um, I didn't have a place to live. I didn't know anybody. I found a coach to sleep on for six months. I couldn't afford rent. I couldn't afford my food. Um, but I worked at this small little marketing agency, which had won the Gatorade contract. Um, if I fast forward from that two years later, um, I was running national programs. I could afford things. I could buy and get an apartment. And the rest is really history. And I stayed at that company, which, as you acknowledge, is a company called Mosaic. Um, and I stayed there for a couple of years and they were doing big programs with Pepsi. And I decided, who's doing Coke? Right. It's not I didn't recreate the wheel. So I created my own agency called CIM with a couple of partners, and we were 25 years old, and um, the rest is history. We we went at it and um, created a really cool company. We were young guys and not very corporate at all. We didn't want corporate policy. We did we wanted to work hard, play hard, and we played really hard. Um, and we we created something known in the Canadian landscape as the is the CIM magic, and that magic to this day still exists with so many of the folks. So, what was yeah. the original idea with CIM? Uh, and I want to hear too, why did you choose the small marketing agency over Quaker? You know, it was uh, there was a gut instinct there that I thought I would be able to foster my career faster, moving to a big city, um, working for a small agency. I knew I'd be thrown to the wolves. Um, and And I was, as a student, working a territory for Gatorade. I was doing things I never thought I should have been doing in terms of budget allocation, expense accounts, all those stuff. And I knew I wanted to grow fast. There was just something burning in me. And I I also knew through research that if I go work corporate, you know, you're going to stay in a job for five years, then you're going to get promoted to the next job for the next five years. And that is just not the way I'm cut. I've never worked a corporate job. I know I would never survive in a corporate environment. So I've had this entrepreneurial burning spirit the entire time. Um, and so it was just a gut call. I'm going to move yeah. to a city and live on a couch and hopefully I'm going to make it. It sounds like you knew yourself a little bit because sometimes maybe someone else's personality would make sense. So like, yeah, that corporate sounds much better. But for you, you right. knew that was not going to be your path. What was the original idea of the services when you launched um, consumer impact marketing? What was the uh, initial offering? Yeah, the initial offering was brand sampling. Like it was simple. Our first client was Wrigley's Gum and they just needed a bunch of students to pass out gum. So it wasn't very complicated. Um, and we were growing nicely in the experiential marketing, what they is referred to now as XM, experiential marketing. We were growing nice, but there was a big tide changing in the, in the North American landscape. US offices were right-sizing and downsizing and the Canadian industry was hit really hard with that. And so companies in Canada which had a traditional sales force, Heinz, Wrigley, Kraft, American Express, Microsoft. I could go down the list. These companies were right-sizing and outsourcing at a never-seen-before pace. And we made a critical decision to really pivot and, and, and get into the third-party sales force management. Um, and we did that. And so our business, uh, we grew to $100 million. 75% of it was sales force management. And that's where we had thousands of people. You know, we would replicate a sales organization structure, VP of sales, regional sales managers, sales reps, but they were all contract. And most of them at the same time were permanent part-time, which typically back then were moms. They didn't want to work full-time. 
They left the workforce to have babies and they wanted to go back and work two to three days per week. That was the bulk of our workforce. So we found the right source of people with expertise. We found the right economic model. So when we go and work and pitch Heinz Ketchup to take over their sales force, they had 53 full-time people. We replaced them with with 53 part-time people. We had the same number of calls, same size territories, same everything. What was eliminated? The Friday afternoon golf games and go to the pub early on a Thursday afternoon because their sales force has been there for 20 years and this is what was happening. Um, so that's that was the big pivot that turned that business into a huge success. How did you get your first initial key clients? Because you say, oh, we had Wrigley. That doesn't sound so easy to me just to no. get Wrigley. No. Um, I mean, my the big one, as it turns out, was Gatorade. And so um, there was a lot of good luck. I would say along my career, people say, you know, you, you don't get good luck. You get, you know, you create the luck. Well, I've had a couple I could say it was good luck. Uh, like I really didn't have the decision. And I think we made a lot of great decisions along the way to keep the journey going. But I was a summer student doing Gatorade. Two years later, I start my own company with a partner. Um, Gatorade was owned by Quaker Oats. We were also doing Pepsi. Pepsi launched a sport drink. Back then, it was called All Sport. Um, and um, all of a sudden, there was a big war over who was going to buy Gatorade. So Coke was in the running. Pepsi was in the running. Quaker was trying to sell it off, and they sold it. And they sold it um, to Pepsi. So um, what happened at that time is Pepsi said, you know, under an agency, you can't have both products. Uh, and they were forced to push a product elsewhere. And since I had great relationships there, I was running the national campaign. They called me and said, can you guys handle this? That was a $10 million contract overnight. So we took from a little summer sales Gatorade opportunity, I turned that into a $10 million program. And that was the anchor to our ship um, that grew us to 100 million for sure. So at that point, how many staff do you have? Because do you have to go out and then start frantically sourcing staff? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, when we talk staff, there's the, the call them the sales reps or the field reps or the marketing reps. That that was the flux that would, you know, at the end of the day, we rolled up to about 7,000, you know, tactical staff. Our head office staff, as we grew the business, we started with two or three of us, you know, and exponentially, we were just adding tens and tens and tens all the time. And so at that time, you know, let's say a year into the business, we probably had 40 full time staff. Um, you know, on employee benefits, et cetera. And we probably had about 300 tactical staff. And then it just keeps every client we added. We were batting, um, you know, from a sales perspective, you know, RFPs were being issued. Uh, the Canadian landscape was outsourcing like crazy because the American landscape was putting pressure to reduce costs. Um, we were winning close to 70 to 80% of every RFP that came out. And these were multi, multi-million dollar RFPs. Um, and so it was just the perfect storm. We were on a high. Industry was outsourcing. There was a large pool of talent who were, you know, untapped before these permanent part-time moms. Um, and it was the perfect storm. How do you account for winning that high percentage of RFPs? Well, I would tell you now in hindsight, two things. Uh, one was personality and two uh, was results. So um we had the reputation of being the young guns in the industry. We had some competitors, including Mosaic. Uh, we were the young guns. We weren't afraid to say no. We weren't afraid to call a spade a spade. We weren't very polished. Um, and people were buying that. They were like, these guys are authentic. They're transparent. Um, and they're not afraid. Uh, and so they didn't get any bureaucratic BS from us. And I'm not saying Mosaic does that, but they were a much larger, older organization than we were. Um, and so our personality shone through and we rolled up our sleeves. We were the CEOs and we were the ones doing everything. Like we were cutting the territories, training sales reps, like, you know, and our competitors wouldn't have, you wouldn't have seen the CEOs do that. So personality was critical. And I think the, the second thing was results. I mean, we were all in, we had mortgaged our houses. We had mortgaged everything to start this business. Um, and, um, the failure was not an option. So we, 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 if a sales rep was sick, we got in our cars and drove to those stores and made those sales calls. Um, and that's what it took for us to pr produce the results we were producing. And then it was, how do you scale that and get to make sure you got the right training process. So all the rest of the team around you would take the same mentality to drive success for our clients' brands. What was one of those times you remember now it seems it's a great story, but then it was painful that someone last minute quit and or or couldn't make it and you had to literally hop and drive somewhere 
dozens and dozens of times. I mean, literally I used to, and I'm not kidding you, I would cry. We would, I would get, whether it was a, not so much on the tactical team, the tactical team, I think we could figure out because um, there was lots of resources for it, but the management group, the full-time employees, um, you know, we were a small entrepreneurial company. There was not a lot of process. We really didn't even have HR. We didn't have a lot of forms. We didn't have a lot of stuff ready to go. And so people we were attracting to our agency were loving the spirit. They would get inside and maybe they came from a corporation like Coca-Cola and they're like, well, where's this? Where's that? We're, and we're like, uh, we don't have it. So if you want it, we should create it. And that wasn't for everybody. And so we had high turn. And I remember when our management group were turning, it hit me personally. I took it personally because we were young guys and I was personal relationships with them. They're at my house. They saw my kids like it was personal. I would cry and I would lose sleep. And I'm like, you know, and we finally got to a point where I, I, I realized the business is bigger than the people and it's bigger because of the people, but it's bigger than the people. And I can't lose sleep over every single person that's going to make a change. And that really changed my outlook on people. And even today, when somebody on my team talks to me that I'm not over happy and all that stuff, and they're nervous to talk about it, or whether it's compensation or career pathing, I am the first one to say, look, if this isn't the right fit for you, I'm going to support you. I'm going to be a reference for you. And I will help you find the right place of where you should belong if it's not here. Um, and I would have never done that as a youngster. And I would have, you know, and some companies don't do that. When they say I'm leaving, they, the, the door hits you in the ass. I don't do that. Um, it's not worth it. We're on the planet once, be nice to people, and it comes back to you. And maybe that's serendipitous for the name of my company called Karma, because we believe in a lot of good karma. You you mentioned one of the things was the results and the transparency and the personality. What was um, an example of or story of, you said, we call the spade a spade. Like they, you just give it to them straight. What was an example of where you had to do that? Yeah, I mean, in in any, I would say, and this might broad stroke it, in any agency client relationship, generally what I've seen is you're getting results, you're finding out information, and sometimes you want to see that most often before you present it to the client. So there's an opportunity to either sugarcoat it, soften it, discuss what, decide what you want to share and what you don't want to share. Um, and that happens all the time. And, you know, we decided at an early age, we're not going to do that. We want to share the results at the same time we get them. No sugar coating, no manipulation, no verbiage. These are the results. Um, and we did that. And, um, and some of our clients were shocked by that. Um, and at first there was turbulence with that. And then they got accustomed to this is the way we'd want to do it. If we were doing it ourselves and insourcing it, not outsourcing it, this is what we would see. Uh, and so real live examples, you know, uh, number of hours worked, um, number of stores called on, number of cases sold. Um, all three of these key variables can be manipulated. You can pick a time and date. You can run that calendar to a Friday afternoon, or you could run it to Sunday night at 10 p.m. Um, so there's lots of little ways that you could manipulate that data. And you hear it with sales organizations today, well, it's at the end of the quarter, you know, if we haven't hit the numbers, let's pump, 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 and we'll take some next quarter sales and we'll book them on the last day here and we'll make this quarter look good. We just didn't do that. Like we just, you know, the numbers are real. We're going to stick to the same goalposts every time we're going to measure something and we're going to give you the good, bad, and the ugly. And again, turbulence up front, but then people really subscribe to that model and methodology, which is the same methodology I'm doing today with Karma. It sounds like at that point, you know, at this point, you figured out some of this permanent part-time staffing issues, but then you hadn't exactly. So how are you finding talent so quickly as you were growing so quickly back then? On the experiential marketing side, uh, which is your typical 17 to 28-year-old uh, doing brand ambassador work, passing out samples, that market is an evolutioning market. There's a big turnstile with it. It's typically university kids, you know, some younger, some older, but typically that window. Uh, and so you kind of have a fresh crop every 12 months. Um, and so that business, although it's hard to manage it, there's always a steady stream of people. Um, on the permanent part-time, um, I think we hit it at a good time. We really didn't struggle with finding people um, who were qualified to be able to do the work that we were doing at the pace that we were growing. Um, I would say today, 
those models have um, you know evolved to maybe a little even more full time work, um, and I think that's causing more problems. The gig economy, you want your tactical workforce. I think there's a good good pipeline of people coming into that workforce all the time. Permanent part-time, I think there's a good steady body of uh, resources to be able to draw from because there's lots of people who want to work part-time. The full-time ones are the harder ones now because now the expectations coming out of pandemic are you know, uh, higher wages, bigger commitments, What's the benefit plan? What's my RSP? And you know what are what are all these things that you're going to do for me now? Um, because it's an employee market. Before the pandemic, it was an employer market, and so that market is definitely harder for us. Um, and we're seeing the pains of that in the in the in the pan, post pandemic era for sure. What were some of the you you mentioned you hired um, you know leadership pretty quickly? Actually, um, a lot of times the people I talk to, it's like it's over years, maybe even a decade, and yours within a year. Yeah. Looking back, what were some things that maybe you did right or maybe you could improve on as far as like putting a leader? I mean, you've done this multiple times. Like, how do you now think about putting a leadership team together for a business? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I. One of my life lessons, you know, in all my different ventures is, you know, talking about leadership, it starts with the partnership. Uh, and so that's a whole, you know, chapter in itself to, to you know, what's the right kind of partnership you want um, going into it and how do you manage that and how do you exit from a great partnership? Um, but let's park that one, you know, leadership team. So let's call that your executive level. Let's call it director level. Um, you're right. In many of the ventures um, that had to be brought on quickly in order for us to scale the business. Um, and so, you know, at that time, you know, we hired people who had the relative experience. We definitely paid them higher than the market would pay. They were making more money than the owners of the company. And we had to invest in that. And it was a long term strategy. So back then, if I was making $10 an hour, uh, they were making 15. And we had as the owners, we had, and those aren't the real numbers, um, but we as the owners had to subscribe to the fact that we're going to invest in this and maybe even lose money. For the next year or two to overinvest in these resources in order for us to scale in the future. So those were big bets. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, um, and those bets worked 99% of the time. I think when we grew our business, you know, we got north of 50 to 60 million. Um, you know, our consultants would come in and say, Oh, you guys need it, you need to be ready. Now you're going to the next level. And so you should think about outside leadership. So you know, we always held the executive positions, quite honestly, the, the president, CEO, and the executive VPs. Um, but then, you know, our consultants were saying, well, maybe you should bring in an outside president and they're going to help you get to that next level. And so we said, okay, you know, put our egos aside, let's do that. Um, and we went through four presidents and not one of them lasted more than six months. And we concluded, don't doubt yourselves. We are smarter than what our consultants know about our business. We know our business better than anybody that's going to come from the outside. And if we need help to scale, Get us some financial help. Get us some capital help. Um, we don't need our business help. Um, and so that was a life lesson that to this day, I have not altered from. I In all my ventures, I am not bringing in an outsider who doesn't know the industry to run my companies. Um, I'm going to continue to do that. I so, think the other key, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so now you would, you would grow someone within or Correct. it'd be, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. From within. Um, and I've done that successfully in, in a number of the companies. I think the other key to leadership um, is we always set out to hire people smarter than we were. Surround yourself. And that's hard to do because you don't, you can't judge it that well um, in an interview. Like this is a process and we just don't do your standard one hour interview, check your references and away you go, you're hired. Uh, we do experiential uh, interviews. We do dinners. We do, you know, let's go for lunch. And this is, we're dating. Um, and, and you're doing this uh, at, a, at a speed um, that is comfortable for both um, because these are big decisions. Um, but I've always surrounded myself with, I believe, people to be smarter than me. I'm not afraid to do that. I hope that they are. And one of my examples, I started a med tech company called IMD. Um, you might recall when I was my first week of university, I thought I was going to be a doctor. Then I quickly learned I actually don't like going to doctors. I don't like going to hospitals. I don't like the sight of blood. I cannot be a doctor. Um, and so um, I started a med tech company and I am selling products and services to doctors, to pharmacists, to hospitals. 
I know nothing about it at all. Um, but here I am not afraid. And because of the life lessons I've got, I can apply my skills. Um, and I go hire two VPs, um, you know, from the pharmaceutical industry and the med tech industry. And that's the only reason why that company was a success. It was not because of me. And so, you know, those are those are big lessons to learn and, and, uh, and powerful ones for sure. Let's talk about, go back to the learnings and the exit piece. You know, when someone's starting a company in their early 20s, they're not thinking about exiting, right? What are some things you wish you would have put in place along the way if you were thinking, oh, we should probably plan for an exit someday? Yeah, uh, that is my, It's if I have my top three life lessons of being an entrepreneur, this is one of them for sure. And you're right, when I started CIM, we did not have exit in mind. All we thought talked about was growth and where our revenues would be and how profitable we think we should be. Um, and we never thought about, so what's the exit? I've taken that. And when I did exit that business, uh, it there was turbulence for sure. Uh, between my partner and I, we had to go to a shotgun situation. Um, and, you know, I'll leave the rest out, you know, confidential. But, it, you know, there was a lot of lessons along the way. And every venture since that, when I've written my business plan and my strategy, a part of that is the exit strategy. So what is the mark? What's the size? What kind of multiple? Who would be potential buyers? What market segment? How do they value your company in this? And like I, even with Karma today, people look at us and say, are you a people services company or are you a technology company? And I say, I'm a technology company. But when I talk to investors and they say, well, I think you're a services company, I need to keep pivoting and changing what's happening within my team and my strategies to get us to a technology multiple, because that's the exit strategy. Tech multiples are much higher than services multiples. And so that, those guiding principles are shape our board meetings. They shape our strategy because we know where we want to end up. And I already have a short list of, of companies where I think that exit will happen for each one of my businesses. So life lesson, think about the end in mind, plan it, build your strategies around how you're going to achieve that and don't get mired in all the noise that comes your way. Stay focused on that plan and and uh, it should happen. Knowing what you know now with what happened, what would you put in place? Would it just be like different agreements that if X happened, yeah. you know, Y happened? In my legal agreements and my shareholders agreements, all of them now moving forward from my lessons from the CIM days, um, I've got exit strategies in there. What are the multiple expectations? I've got a shotgun provision in every single one of them because you just don't know your partners um, and you don't know what happens in life with your partner. Somebody might become ill. Somebody might decide to move away uh, and not work in the business. So we've got shotguns and provisions. We've set floor ceiling prices in the agreement. We've set expected uh, multiples if there's going to be a management buyout. So all of these kind of terms that are used in exiting a business, um, I've already baked into our agreement. So it's black and white. In fact, even down to compensation, I put trigger a table in place that says based on these revenues and, the, and this profitability for the senior leadership team and ownership group, here's the compensation we're going to receive when we hit these milestones. There's no discussion. There's no, you know, um, there's no conversation about it. This is what we've all subscribed to. This is what we've signed to. And when we hit these, we're good. So the only gray area, because I'm doing it right now, actually, I'm having some conversations about capital uh, for future growth, um, is, you know, you can't control what the markets do and you can't control valuations and you can't control who's going to buy you. Um, but these are regular conversations at the board. We talk about it every quarter um, just to see if there's been any shift and change. And um, some of those organizations that are on those lists. I've already had conversations with. And it's not about, hey, buy me now or invest in me now. Uh, it is talking about our service and get them excited. And in fact, three of them are actually clients of mine. This is a long-term strategy. I haven't even hit them yet with what I want to do with them, but I want them drinking my Kool-Aid for a couple of years. And then I believe the timing is going to be right. And it should be, I hope, um, you know, a bit of a bidding war um, when that time comes. Talk for a second if people aren't familiar with the concept of, of the shotgun situation. Sure. Yeah. So in a shareholder agreement, um, you know, hopefully you're, you play. By the nice. way, this doesn't involve actual guns. I just. Yeah. Anything. There's no guns. No, <laughs> uh, this is a, it's a clause in your shareholder agreement that basically forces the hand of, of a shareholder. So whether you're two shareholders or many, um, a shotgun, I could issue Jeremy, if you and I were partners and we have a shotgun provision, um, I could issue you the shotgun. And what it says is I'm going to buy the company that we own for X dollars. And you've got 
10 days, 20 days to decide if you want to sell it to me for X dollars. And if your answer is you don't want to sell it to me, then you actually have to buy it from me at that same price. It forces a decision. Somebody is buying the company. It's whether it's the person who's issued it or the person who's received it. And also it forces the person to think of a fair price, right? Because if if you're like, hey, um, I want a uh, billion dollars for this, yeah, then the person says, no, well, then you have to buy it from me for that amount. Oh, you're right. So yeah, it, it keeps it, everybody honest and it forces a decision. And again, that's it's kind of a last ditch effort. If you hit a stalemate, I'm assuming before you hit to a shotgun, you've had a lot of conversation. Maybe you've tried management buyouts, maybe you've tried, you know, different liquidity opportunities for the shareholder that you know maybe isn't as happy. Um, that's a last ditch effort, but it it works and it's a great tool. Let's talk about karma casting. I mean, I feel like you created the solution you wish you had um yes. at CIM a little yeah. bit. Um, and I'd love to hear how you think about because every I'll make this generalization. I, I think is every service company wants to be multiple than sell for a SaaS tech platform uh, uh, price, right? Um, and I, I don't. Know, I, I consider you. Uh, this is from my observation, but like kind of like the Uber for staffing for on-demand right. staffing, essentially. Yeah. And Uber is a tech platform. But how do you get? Because some people may think, oh, this is a service, is it tech? How do you get in position this and ask you create it so it is tech, even though there's people involved? Yeah, I mean, this is probably you're hitting on one of the biggest pain points we have in our business. And so, you know, I spent 25 years in the third party sales and marketing industry. I left, did med tech. I wanted to come back into our industry, but I wanted to do it different. And you hit the nail on the head. I know it gets overused, but we are the Uber for the XM industry. And so what does Uber do? It's a tech platform that matches drivers with passengers. It's quite simple. And it's a marketplace. So money flows in there. You can see who they are. It's very transparent. And so having learned lessons for 25 years of all the pain points in managing talent, um, both you know from a marketing program or an outsourced Salesforce program, we created Karma. And we are the leading app um, in North America um, we have over 60,000 brand ambassadors today using our app, and that's about 30,000 in each country and growing daily. Um, we represent over 500 corporate clients, um, and it's working. And we've been doing it for seven years now. And so how do we adjust the difference? So we call ourselves a tech platform, uh, and we supply and produce people uh, through that tech platform. And like Uber, we uh, connect talent uh, to brands like Uber is drivers to passengers. Uh, and so there's a bunch of stuff that happens in between there, um, but that's in essence what the Karma platform does. Um, we've decided not to be distracted like any other agency. Lots of agencies are full service. They do brand, they do strategy, they do communications, they'll get you some swag, they'll get you a deckled vehicle. We don't do any of that. We're a marketplace on an app that allows and puts the control of the gig economy in the marketing space in the hands of the brand ambassador. They're sitting at home, they've created a profile, it's 200 questions deep, um, we're casting for talent, we're not recruiting staff and there's a big difference there. And based upon what you put into the app of when you're available to work, the skill sets you have, the profile you have, the language you speak, your body type, your body size, all of those things go into the app, you then get broadcasted messages saying, hey, here's some gigs in your market. Do you want to work for these? Coca-Cola, American Express, Costco, I could go down the list. Um, and they apply right there through the app. And when they click on that button, it tells you all about the gig, gives you a map of where it's located, where you have to be. It tells you all the training that has to happen. It tells you exactly what time you need to be there. And then the app really takes over because there's thousands of people working all the time. And obviously, management can't be everywhere. And so if you had 10 people working in LA, um, they all have to check in through the app, take a, a facial recognition software. Uh, so we know it's the person we hired. We know it's the person we trained. And it's all through, also through GPS coordination. We know exactly where they're located. And in this industry for 25 years, I can tell you there are problems. People accept gigs, they don't show up. People take a gig and they send their sister. Um, you know, People say, oh, I worked four hours, but three of them I was sitting at home. Uh, and so our app eliminates all of that. We know mm -hmm. full transparency. That's why the facial recognition. I'm sure there's a feature 
because someone is messed up, right? It's like, oh, they sent someone else. We need a facial recognition feature, right? Yes, that's right. They do. And there's, you know, there's entrepreneurs in that industry. I wouldn't even think about that. Yeah. 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 So facial recognition, GPS coordination, they execute through the app. They're taking pictures, real-time data. They have to check out. And in our world, they don't get paid unless they've checked in and checked out using their mobile phone. Um, and the client's getting that data in real time um, as we get it. It's fully transparent. And we know exactly what they've worked. And they also get paid within two days through the app. So there's we actually right now have got 60,000 brand ambassadors. We don't have an HR department. And we don't have a payroll department. Um, which most people say, how the heck are you doing that? And so we have turned this model and the experiential marketing agency model upside down. In Canada, we have zero competitors. In the US, there are two players uh, do similar work to what we do. Um, one of them is very similar to us. The other one is not. Uh, and this is the biggest business problem we have is um, being SaaS. When you talk about the, to the capital markets, everybody gets excited. Oh, your SaaS revenue, SaaS revenue, and you're going to get bigger multiples. We um, we want to be SaaS revenue, but there's a big difference. SaaS revenue is it's just like you got Microsoft on your laptop. You pay a licensing fee. You don't talk to anybody, and you just get to use the software. In our world, you have that, but we also supply you the people. Uh, and so, you know, it's a two it's a two headed horse here. And both of them are equally important for us. And it is a differentiator. So if, you know, Coca-Cola wants to hire 500 people to do a national campaign across the U.S., um, when they come to us, we actually give them the 500 people. Um, other agencies don't do that. Uh, and so it is a competitive advantage. We just need to continue to message how we're a tech platform that produces the people. And that's the big conundrum that we're in right now. Have you had... Um... Companies come to you just to, to use a platform for their internal staff? Yeah, they, and, we, they, and we say no. Hmm. And that's a tough one. That's a tough one for us to say. And that's being, you know, I'm not the young guy anymore, but I'm still not afraid to say no. Um, and, and why is that? We want to be North America's largest experiential marketing marketplace. We want, we are that. We're on pace to do that. We're 60,000 people now in our marketplace. Um, we think by the end of this year, we're going to be close to 90,000 people in our in our marketplace. As soon as we allow somebody to use our software as a service, now there's two marketplaces and another company. Now there's three. We want all brand ambassadors, their first place to go to get the gig work is to go to Karma. And there they're going to see hundreds and hundreds of brands they can work for. And we are about 50 percent of our business is brand direct relationships. So we sell directly to the brands, let's say like Coca-Cola, um, and the other 50% are through agencies. So pre-pandemic, our agency business was small. Coming out of the pandemic, agencies had to right size, downsize. They got rid of HR. They got rid of recruiters. There was no live events. They lost a lot of the brand ambassadors. We actually held on to them because we had a lot of gigs going because different types of gigs, not just you know people experience gigs. Um, and so those agencies now are not bringing all those fixed costs back um, and they need to outsource. So some of our biggest competitors pre-pandemic are now our biggest customers post-pandemic. How do you vet these? You mentioned there's like a 200 question questionnaire because obviously it's the people then. How do you, how have you found the best vet these people? Um, you know, because it's your reputation. Someone doesn't show yeah. up. Someone send someone else someone's not yeah, yeah. they well, show up and they're terrible i mean there's you've probably seen every oh, iteration yeah. of this yeah you know we're still dealing with human capital and uh weather events snowstorms in canada and um you know dog ate my homework these things still happen dealing with talent uh and so you know one of the things we're very proud of is we deliver a 99 percent compliance rate if a brand has asked us to do we're doing a major event in las vegas uh next month um, 300 people. We will deliver 99% of that target of 300 people. And we've delivered 99% compliance for seven years straight. And that's because our technology knows almost in advance if somebody um, has been hired uh, and they're supposed to be at the event at 10 o'clock in the morning, we know through GPS coordination at 9 a.m. if they're actually moving. We, they get text messages saying, get ready for your shift. You need to be getting dressed and driving to your event. We know at 10, at 10 o'clock if they've checked in or not. If they haven't, they're getting an instant phone call saying, where are you? My manager can then instantaneously re-recruit for that within minutes. Uh, other agencies will be hours. Um, and so that's how we're delivering 99%.
the way we deliver um, the vetting process is when you complete a profile with us, um, it goes into our, our group and they actually validate the profile. Um, so there is human interaction on the back end. Uh, I've got a team of people that make sure that we're vetting all the folks um, based upon experiences and all that kind of stuff. They get a five-star rating within our system. So all 60,000 people today are five-star rated. Um, if you're brand new to our ecosystem, you don't have a rating. So we're going to cast you. We're going to put you onto a gig. When you get casted and put on a gig, you also have an interview with my team. So it's not all digital. We still need to validate the information uh, just so people don't put in fake stuff. Um, and so that human interaction also is part of the validation process. When they are executing the gig, yeah, if they are not doing a good job, we are going to hear about it from the client, from the retailer, from the event personnel. Um, and that goes right back into our system. It goes right into their five-star rating. Um, if somebody has done a horrible job and they're just not a fit, we get rid of them out of our, our system by social insurance number. If, if, if it's a training opportunity, then we put them through the Karma, what we call Karma University. Um, and so we give them some core training um, and we've got those those systems set up. So we're we're pretty robust on the training side. Yeah. Yeah. Ask about that because that in itself, that process in technology and flow in itself is valuable. I'm sure companies would pay just for that vetting piece that you do and how you do it, um, because you've done this with, you'll be doing this with almost 90,000 people, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm curious, um, Kevin, you know, what's built in based on feedback, right? I mean, you knew this industry, obviously, in and out, but you still, this is a different platform. Like people yeah. haven't done this before. What did you get feedback from your clients that you actually built into this product? Yeah, first and foremost, um, the person that was staffed uh, and recruited and trained is not the person that showed up. That happens. It's called gig switching. It happens all the time. There are entrepreneurs across North America that will all, you know, one person accepts six shifts on a Saturday. And then they outsource it. And if they're getting paid 25 bucks an hour, they'll sell it to somebody else at 20 bucks an hour and they'll make five sitting at home. Um, this happens all the time. Because there's thousands of people and the brand manager sitting in some office somewhere, they have no exposure to this. So uh, gig switching is the biggest problem we had to solve. So we did that through facial recognition software. The second biggest issue was people pretending to work um, and showing up late, leaving early, not showing up at all, sitting at home, watching the football game and, and you know collecting a check. So we had to do that through GPS coordination. Those are two fundamental issues. And I think the third one that was really hurting the brand ambassador marketplace, um, the, the BAs or brand ambassadors generally don't work, don't get out of bed for less than 100 bucks. So that's a minimum four hour shift at $25 an hour on average. Um, if you've worked a four hour shift, do you think you want to wait two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks for the next payroll run to send you your $100 check? The answer is no. The gig economy is about here and now. It's the Uber experience. You get paid now. And so we had to find a solution across North America to instantly pay people um, and not wait for two weeks. And so we have done that uh, both in Canada with a centralized banking system, and we're doing it in the United States as well with a third-party partner that processes instantaneously. Um, so that's a that's a big thing that is for the talent. The, the second last big thing we did for the talent is we pay them well. So, you know, we're a virtual company. I don't have a head office. Uh, we've got addresses, but they're all Regis workspace. Um, so by design, we are keeping our fixed overheads at a minimum. On average, two thirds of every dollar that our clients give us is what is paid to the brand ambassador. In most agencies, it's 50%, 40%, 30% of the budget is what goes to the talent. In our world, it's 60 to 70% of the budget. So they get paid well, they get paid quickly, and they get great brands to put on their resume. Uh, and that's the marketplace that we've created. It's, you know, two-sided marketplaces are difficult, right? Because there's two sides. Yeah. How do you get partners and brands on who are and who are good partners that should be on here that aren't? Yeah, that's great. I mean, we've got uh, two sides of the business uh, and I call it, it's always two levers. You know, you need enough talent um, to fulfill all the client needs. And if you have too much talent, they're not going to be working as much. They're going to lose faith in your app. Then you had to have enough clients. Uh, so on the client side, you need enough talent to fulfill them. If you have too many clients and not enough talent, that's a problem. Too much talent, not enough clients. That's a problem on this side. 
So it's a delicate balance. It's something that we are challenged with every day. Um, we've got two groups of people leading those areas. So on the talent side, you know, there's a whole engine around that. And then on the client side, we've got our sales group and our client experience group that focuses on that. Um, the types of clients we go after, Fortune 1000 organizations that spend, spend brand dollars. So consumer packaged goods, automotive, financial, athletics, um, you know, sports and entertainment is a big category. Um, alcohol is massive. Cannabis in, in legalized states, huge. Uh, and so you can, you know, if you saw my client roster, which uh, I don't, I've got a few there on my website, but I've got another slide I can send you afterwards, Jeremy, if you want. Um, very impressive client list. And we are very focused on looking at the categories that are growing, where they're investing. Um, we've got a little area in our group uh, for new starts. So if you're a brand new company and you just need a one hit wonder um, and you just got a new listing at a retailer or something like that, we will also help you. So we go as small as working a one four hour shift up to multi-million dollar projects. I'm wondering who are good partners for you? I, I always think of partnerships. Who are good partners for you in the US? I mean, I think of like trade shows. I think of like Costco, like stores, they're always doing some kind of demo with brands. Who are good partners for you that should be should know about karma casting? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, really two avenues there: agencies. So it's a growing area, but agencies are struggling to find the people that we can find. And why is that? The gig workers want to work on technology. They're glued to their phones, and so they're loving working in our our environment. Um, so uh, agencies, um, you know, and that can be advertising agencies who want to get into experiential marketing. That's public relation agencies who are now doing experiential marketing and certainly experiential marketing agencies. And there's lots of them um, that need to find staff. Um, so that's a big category for us. The other one is really, you know, call it the Fortune 1000 organizations. And I'm just looking at my logo list here. You know, some, you know, you, you pick the category automotive transportation. So we got airlines and automotive companies, you know, automotive companies do a lot of road shows. They do a lot of trade shows. They do, you know, consumer tests, all that. CPG, consumer packaged goods, you name it, from, you know, soda companies to, you know, chip companies to cookies, you name it, they're all doing stuff. Um, beverage alcohol is massive, you know, so whether that's a wine and spirits company, a beer company, um, we represent most of them in Canada. We've got a few of them in the United States. We're doing quite a bit on the Eastern Seaboard. Finance, so banks, credit cards, um, big category. Athletics, if you just saw the WNBA promotion and launch uh, in Las Vegas. All the people working there were for Karma. If you saw the Kobe Bryant big promotion, the Black Mamba thing that happened two weeks in LA, all those folks were working for Karma. So we're, we've got some good things. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff in New York right now with Nike. So uh, athletics is a big category. Electronics. So our big customers there, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, Google, Samsung, those types of organizations. The list goes on. Like the, I, I love it. No, kidding. Kevin, I just want to be the first one. Thank you for sharing your journey, your expertise. I mean, there's so much to dig into on all of these businesses. So I know we just scratched the surface, but it is super valuable. I want to encourage everyone to check out karmacasting.com. And Kevin, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. It's been a, a real treat to talk with you, Jeremy. And thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand